So to speak to this creative fuel and how it impacts their lives and careers, I'm pleased to welcome Twin Brothers curator, artist, Stefan and Jason Saint Laurent. We're really happy to be here and uh, to be uh, speaking on the subject of curiosity. Uh, yeah, and we're not morning people. Uh, I, f <laughs> I feel like I have electricity running through my body. It's uh, uh, very fun to be here. Uh, it's a new experience for us to be up at the 7 a.m. in the morning. <laughs> And to be speaking together, actually, that rarely happens. So yeah. you, you really got us thinking about how we came um, to our current places in the world as artists and curators. Um, so we're going to uh, take you, oh God, we won't mention the number of years, but back to uh, our childhood. Uh, <laughs> so this is uh, Stefan and I and our mom. Uh, as you can tell, this is Halloween. Uh, we've got toilet paper and uh, hosiery, or yeah. an Avon lipstick, <laughs> and a pillowcase. Uh, <laughs> we, uh, we grew up with a single mom in a tiny little basement apartment in Moncton, New Brunswick. Uh, we didn't have money for Halloween costumes, so you know, we had to go digging in, you know, in the garbage and uh, in other places. Uh, and we sort of, we, we picked this photograph because it sort of exemplifies um, our initial uh, curiosity around costume and performance and that sort of thing. And I think, you know, if we were... Uh, back in those days, buying off-the-shelf costumes, I'm not sure we would have been uh, piqued the way we were by uh, art and... Yeah, it's like... Uh, <laughs> I mean, my mother and my grandmother allowed us to do whatever we wanted, and that's one of the things that really liberated us as children. I mean, look at how young we are and our mother allowing us to do uh, monster drag. You know, it's like... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we, <laughs> we picked only one image, but we've got many, many images of us doing granny drag, monster drag, all kinds of, uh, all kinds of drag performances. Uh, in, uh, you know, growing up, our uh, grandmother had Sunday dinners, and for almost a decade, every week, we had a show in the basement. Um, and it involved all kinds of things. Uh, <laughs> Particularly uh, our, our cousins, we used to uh, use them as props for our performances. Uh, much to the chagrin of our aunts and uncles when we'd strip them down and, and put cone tits on our, uh, on our cousin to look like Madonna, you know? It, it, was, it was outrageous and we got away with it. And uh, I think that was our initial sort of spark uh, we wanted to become artists. Yeah. I mean, that's a good segue into our presentations. We thought of um, putting something together that would allow you to see a bit what our creative process is to go through an idea. And sometimes ideas take many, many years to kind of form. Um, we've always been very curious about animals. Uh, uh, since a very young age, and I wanted to reconnect with the animal world. I had heard about painting elephants, uh, human-animal collaborations, creativity of animals in the wild. Uh, so I organized a show called Animal House Works of Art Made by Animals, and it was presented at Saw Gallery about 10 years ago. Uh, I'll go through a few images here. Uh, this was a dog that was trained to sing opera uh, with his uh, human uh, collaborator, Julie Andreev. And here we see a different uh, architecture that's, uh, that's a termite. Uh, uh, being creative and, and making a termite mound, uh, which was created by a human because we didn't want to take anything away from nature, so we reproduced everything in the exhibition. Here we see uh, some nesting. Uh, this is a piece by uh, 
Tillamook Cheddar, who passed away uh, a few years ago from New York City, uh, who would collaborate with Bauman Hasty and start scratching uh, the surfaces of some of the works uh, that he made in the studio. Uh, this was a dog, by the way. Yes. <laughs> Uh, this is a work by Carolee Schneeman, who some of you may know in the art world, as she's a very influential uh, filmmaker uh, and uh, performance artist. And here she had uh, photos of her uh, with her cat kissing her every morning, and it's called Infinity Kisses. I'll show you uh, another work uh, by Carolee a little bit later. Here we see Washo, uh, the chimpanzee on the right-hand side, uh, who made this work uh, in a laboratory. Um, so this was the, I, I was curious about the subject, and then as I delved into it, I realized that animals were, were being exploited. Uh, we think that this is from their own creative uh, impulse, but it is absolutely not. They're trained like circus animals to paint. Uh, you probably have seen a lot of the uh, Asian elephants that are painting, and they're trained heavily for many years before they can uh, start applying paint onto a surface, and the trainers are actually pushing them to make something representational. So. All of that was coming to me as I was doing more and more research. So the exhibition ended up being really about the exploitation of animals, a bit like we, see, we saw in circuses, and then moved. Uh, this is also uh, paintings by elephants. And I went to visit Sila, the elephant, in uh, Indonesia uh, about four years ago to thank her for uh, allowing us to show the work you see on the left. Uh, this is by a turtle called uh, Kyra. Uh, this is a, a nesting. These are uh, nesting as well. And this I wanted to bring your attention. Uh, the photo you see on the right-hand side is a photo taken of Carolee Schneeman by her cat. And uh, this started a whole series of her. The cat really knew how to interact uh, with the camera. He knew that it captured images, and every morning he would uh, take a picture of her. She would leave the camera uh, on the side of the bed. So this was the first image. And on the left-hand side, her other cat, uh, Kitsch, uh, had gotten into her studio, took a paintbrush, and started painting like her. And uh, this was like a, a kind of a revelatory moment. It, it surprised me that an artist of her stature was so esoteric. She totally believed that some of her cats uh, had uh, reincarnated and that her husbands were actually uh, inside uh, the cats uh, that she was adopting. And yeah, it opened uh, uh, a lot for me in terms of uh, yeah, developing my instincts and, and developing my, my relationship with animals and being able to talk to them. My brother is, is not as esoteric as I am. Um, uh, this is Tillamook uh, visiting the exhibition for the first time. And one of the interesting things in the show, everything was hung low so that animals could come and see the exhibition and also children. And we even uh, created these devices here. You see how everything is on an angle so that adults that are looking at the work can see it just as well as a child or a uh, companion animal that came to the exhibition. So we really thought of different ways of showing animal art uh, that would not just be for humans. I'll just go through a few images here. And this is what we call ac incidental or accidental animal art. It's when animals are just put onto a canvas and they just act in, an, in their own animal way, but they're not actually being creative. Um, and this is Sila, who I went to visit uh, close to uh, Jogjakarta in Java. Uh, and this brought me to go to Indonesia and do a project called Please Feed the Animals. Um, I covered my body in different animal food and I made an offering to the animal world. So I would go to different animal sanct sanctuaries uh, uh, throughout uh, Bali and Java. And uh, I would film uh, the animals uh, kind of uh, 
interacting and what I was thinking after uh, doing the project Animal House is like, how can I work with animals and not take anything away from them to really do a, a gesture that would, you know, uh, just be a gift to the animal world. And it, you know, some things were more successful than others. Uh, the m <laughs> Here was a, a gift to the sunfish. And then I did an exhibition uh, at Ex New Set before I worked there as director. Uh, and uh, Carolee Schneeman came and helped. Uh, this is one of the installations. And, uh, and part of that project was, uh, uh, what did we call it? Haute cuisine pour les chats et rang de hull. Haute cuisine for the street cats of Hull. Uh, we did a cooking show with uh, Carolee Schneeman and Marisol Foucault from the really great restaurant in, in Gatineau called Edgar. And we created all these beautiful dishes for the street cats in Hull, which was quite a problem about, you know, uh, five years ago. There were many street cats. Uh, so we started a project and tried to get all the cats adopted. And uh, we came, we, about 40 volunteers had plates and we all walked down in downtown Gatineau and served all the street cats, and they all came out. They had a beautiful feast. It was getting close to winter time, uh, so I think they really appreciated it. And uh, the, <laughs> what you see on top, the top left, those little meatballs, they were like buffalo, caribou meatballs cooked in duck fat and uh, with fresh catnip on top, and that was the hit. You know? <laughs> This is me and Carolee eating fresh catnip together. <laughs> and I had seen a squirrel from a balcony and I said, there's something wrong. And I came down and he climbed right on top of me right away. He was kind of a little teenage squirrel and uh, I brought him to a park so that he wouldn't be in downtown Ottawa in trouble. Uh, when I was in Bali, we did the, I did some volunteer work for uh, the Bali Animal Welfare Association. This is a, an ambulance for the street dogs in Denpasar. And uh, this is one of my babies, a chibi, who passed away l last year. Um, and uh, yeah, we, she had a distemper and we were able to feed her some vitamins and, and save her and she became my best buddy. Uh, she came to visit me every morning uh, in uh, Denpasar. And this is me at Monkey Forest getting my head humped <laughs> by my cats. <laughs> I'll just go through these. these uh, this is a turtle uh, sanctuary in uh, Sanur. <coughs> Butterfly Park. This is a show we organized uh, with Saw Gallery and X News set uh, about a year and a half ago, looking at performative practices emerging uh, from Indonesia. I had promised myself I wouldn't work as a curator. I would really go to Indonesia to be an artist, but I could not help myself. Like once I would meet one artist, they would start bringing me on their motorbike, going to their friend's house. No one wanted to show me their work. They all wanted to show me their friends work. So in the end, it, it created an exhibition that was quite exciting. Uh, artists that I would have never met uh, if it were not for the generosity of the artists that were working there. Really, I had to pull work out myself because artists were just not interested in show me, showing me their work, which is so the opposite of like how people can be in the art world in North America. Um, here we see a uh, I think this takes us to Jason's presentation, and then we'll we'll close together. Uh, yeah. Sure. Um, so um, a long time ago, back in my university days, I saw a film by Orson Welles called F Four Fake. Um, one of his, <coughs> I think it was his last film that he ever made, a very experimental documentary fiction hybrid. Uh, that is, um, you know, very well appreciated in the, the cinematic community. But what was 
interesting for me in that film is that uh, part of that story focuses on Elmer de Hori, uh, who was a famous forger, uh, made millions and millions of dollars, lived in Ibiza, uh, had you know a, a dream life, uh, ma making works. Oh, there we go. Um, and then. I started investigating forgery in the art world because I thought it brought up all kinds of interesting questions around authenticity and originality and all those uh, questions that we ponder uh, as curators. And, th and then I, I thought, well, maybe there is um, you know, a nugget of an idea there for an exhibition uh, that would look at forgery and questions of appropriation and authenticity in the art world. And, um, as I was doing my research and investigation, uh, I, f I fell on this one article that talked about a forgery um, a circle in Thunder Bay that was reproducing the works of Norval Morisot, uh, who is, you know, arguably the best indigenous artist uh, painter uh, uh, from Canada. But um, anyway, there are tons more that are just as good as him. But he. Um, he had a major retrospective at the National Gallery some years ago, um, and um, I started looking into uh, what was happening there with his work. And so that was sort of the beginning uh, of the exhibition. Um, there, um, there's rumored to be about 5,000, 6,000 Norval Morso fakes that have circulated on the market. Um, and they've made their way into uh, legitimate collections. Uh, they've been sold by legitimate commercial galleries. Uh, it's a huge web of lies um, uh, that has impacted the art world in a fairly significant way. Um, I can't remember his name from the Bare Naked Ladies, but um, one of them was a Norval Morisot collector. And uh, the AGO in Toronto was ready to mount an exhibition uh, of his work, a retrospective. And uh, they invited him to come on board as a co-curator. And then he brought his favorite painting in his collection that, uh, to the AGO because he wanted it included in the show. Uh, then it was determined to be a fake by uh, the, the, the curators of the AGO. Um, there were all, all kinds of um, uh, uh, hints there uh, from the signature on the back of the painting uh, to the type of materials used, and it was determined to be a fake. And uh, that was in litigation just this week. Uh, and apparently uh, th there's a McLean's article that's coming out, I think on Monday, about this whole issue. So keep your eyes peeled for that because it's actually, uh, it's going to shake up the commercial art market in a very uh, interesting way. Um, then as part of this exhibition, there were other uh, uh, works that were included, um, not just those, what you see there, uh, sorry, on that first image is one of the Norval Morisot fakes that we secured for the exhibition. Uh, but as part of the exhibition, there was, you know, more contemporary approaches to uh, forgery and appropriation. So uh, the images that you see here on the walls is very, it's, it's hilarious. So John Boyle Singfield is a Montreal-based artist. Uh, he's a bit of a shit disturber. And uh, he was in residency um, at, a, at, a, at an art gallery that at that time had a show on contemporary Canadian photography. So he took his cell phone, went to the, went to the exhibition, photographed everything, and those photographs of those works have flashes in them, or they'll have a reflection of the artist taking the picture of those works. Now, he, then he took all of those photographs, blew them up exactly to scale from the original exhibition, and so when his turn came up for his residence, uh, you know, uh, for an exhibition based on the results of his residency in that same space, he mounted the same exhibition, but with all of these appropriated, all of these appropriations. Uh, the artists flipped out that were in the original photography show, and the, the uh, gallery decided to censor the exhibition. So when I read about this, I was like, oh my god, this would fit perfectly within the confines of this F is for fake show, uh, and bring you know, a completely different perspective uh, to the idea of copy and forgery.
So the camouflage series is a, a, a series of works that I've done to keep myself sort of curious. Wherever I travel in the world now, I uh, initiate a new work from this series. So uh, this is me, and it sort of harkens back to that original image that we presented to you, where I've, you know, we've got costumes with toilet paper and uh, really bric-a-brac. Uh, here, uh, I covered myself in very common materials. Here, uh, I covered myself in packing tape. Uh, and then I would sort of do a pathetic attempt to uh, belong. So if you see, you might not be able to see here, but uh, I sort of integrate myself within <laughs> uh, major monuments and major public artworks. This is an Alexander Calder that was built for Expo 67. Um, so that's my Montreal uh, contribution. Here's me again. Those are giant tiger bags I'm covered in. Uh, and you can see me uh, up here integrated on uh, Claude Roussel uh, public artwork uh, in St. John, New Brunswick. Uh, this, this sculpture is actually quite famous in New Brunswick because it was installed. And then, uh, uh, is it Elsie Wayne? Anyway, uh, <laughs> she was the mayor of St. John at the time and lobbied to have that, that sculpture removed because she felt it was just too modern for a city with a historic character. So it was removed, and then there was a controversy about that. It was placed again on top of City Hall, and then I did a version of my camouflage series uh, there. Uh, this is me in Helsinki, covered in aluminum foil, and integrating myself to the Sibelius Monument, so you can see me here. And what was really, uh, really funny, this is one of Helsinki's most famous tourist spots. And it was, you know, a great day, no one around, and we were like, perfect. But then these buses started coming, <laughs> full of Japanese tourists, who came, took photographs, got back on the bus, and drove away without really noticing that I was there. <laughs> so uh, they, <laughs> they might be uh, looking at their pictures at home going, what the fuck? Uh, <laughs> And you know, I just do it over and over again, wherever I travel. This is my hometown tribute. So that's Maman, Louise Bourgeois sculpture at the National Gallery. Here I'm covered in garbage bags and then uh, integrating myself into the, the sculpture. And um, um, it's a series I really, really love doing uh, because before I go to a place, I sort of research to see which monuments have been, um, you know, celebrated or... So I look at the significance and power of monuments in different countries and um, that it brings me... A, it, it gives me a whole other perspective on places that I'm visiting because I'm looking at it from a, a, a really uh, peculiar perspective. Um, so... Um, I will leave it at that. We're going to uh, sort of combine our efforts here, Stefan and I, to um, talk about Saw. Uh, so maybe you can start with... Uh, yeah, well, I mean, some of you may know I was at Saw Gallery as the curator for about seven years, and then Jason followed and is the curator now. Uh, <coughs> and uh, now we both work... Uh, I work in Gatineau. He works in... Ottawa and there's like this very interesting dialogue that happens even though we're twins we have very I would say uh, unique perspectives on the art world so we don't really curate alike you know even though that we're ve we're very much interested in the same subjects uh, yeah it's so nice to be able to have this kind of dialogue happen between the two cities so um, we sort of started our involvement at Saw uh, at the same exact moment. So Saw was ready to celebrate its 30th anniversary. This is some time ago. Um, and they wanted to do an exhibition to celebrate that 30th anniversary. But Saw being Saw didn't want, you know, a show that looks at the past 30 years of artists that have shown there. So uh, Stefan and I, being the shit disturbers that we are, proposed sc Scatalog, 30 years of crap in contemporary art. Uh, <laughs> maybe you can follow through. Uh, it was, my brother had gone to Regina maybe a few weeks before the show was opening. We had already started installing. And uh, 
Chuck Strahl, a conservative MP, uh, sent out a press release denouncing the show, and I had no idea it, it hadn't been sent to us. And I get to Saw Gallery one morning, it's like 10 a.m., and there's every TV station imaginable all lined up on Nicholas Street going onto Rideau Street. And I thought there was a bomb at the, the National <laughs> Defense. It, and I was super scared and I was walking and I get to the courtyard and there's about 50 journalists and they're all asking where Jason and Stefan Saint Laurent are. And I'm like, what the hell happened? <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I spent about I don't know, it must have been two weeks that we did interviews. I mean, that day alone, I was on every national broadcast talking about the show. Just a funny anecdote, the f you know how there's a pecking order for uh, media and CBC is number one. So the first interview was live on the news uh, with CBC. And this guy, I didn't know, a journalist from the, who would probably do political reporting, uh, I'm on live news and my mother is watching and I, but the first question he asked me on national news was, what's your fascination with feces? And I was like, oh my God, I totally did not expect that. And I just told him, you know, like, I'd like to ask you the same question because <laughs> <coughs> you never step foot in here and then all of a sudden you're interested in the art we're presenting. Obviously, it's a subject that fascinates you. <laughs> and he was super pissed to get a bit like <laughs> prodded like that. And then it goes back to Peter Mansbridge and he goes, well, I guess he got you on that one. And, then <laughs> and the reporter was just red faced. Like, oh. <laughs> so yeah, that, it, it, it was Stefan and I sort of um, head diving first into the art world, this exhibition. And, uh, you know, it may sound like, a, a, you know, a bit of a joke, uh, you know, a show titled like that. We were sort of playing on people's uh, uh, perception of art, that they think it's crap, they think contemporary art is crap. And we decided to build a show that looked at, at, at shit as a metaphor. So, you know, it wasn't an ex exhibition of feces. It just looked at the sort of, uh, the metaphor of, uh, of that. Um, so uh, I guess I, oh, my, one little anecdote, we're, we're being uh, pressed for time here, but one last anecdote. Uh, our stepfather was really proud of us when he got the bathroom reader for Christmas and uh, we were in it for this show. I don't know if you guys know this book, but it's a bunch of uh, crazy jokes stories. and crazy stories and whatever that you read while you're in the toilet. Uh, and <laughs> when he, he was having a shit and reading about us, and I thought, wow, uh, full circle. <laughs> so um, before we part, <laughs> um, Saw is currently under construction, and we're about to open. Uh, uh, we're not announcing the date yet, but it's sometime in the fall a new 15,000 square foot facility uh, that will really become a center for urban culture. Um, we'll have new galleries, new reception areas, um, a, a new club and cafe uh, that has a capacity of 300 people. So uh, I'm telling uh, Talene and Maxine that you guys are welcome at SAW when we reopen for anything you wanna do. Uh, we'll donate the space. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> and I guess I'll leave it at that. We're opening up the floor to questions, if I understand. Um, just to kick, to I guess finish it off. If you were to give anybody, and obviously you guys are very creative people. This is your career. You're artists. I feel like you have minds that work very differently than some of us in this room. So if you had uh, just one piece of advice for somebody who's trying to s stay curious, what would you tell them? It's a big one, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, well, for me, that's a pr pretty easy question, actually. And I think what Creative Mornings does is introduces people to new people. Stefan and I are 
very curious in that way. Uh, you know, we, of course, we have our friends in the art world and, and we, you know, we network in those circles, but we're always seeking out new people that don't belong to, um, to our circle. So, you know, for example, we live in Hull now. Uh, and there are some great trashy taverns in Hull <laughs> with some very colorful characters. And we do uh, our best to kind of meet these people and, you know, prod them about art. And, um, you know, I know that Stefan's working with uh, one woman that we've met in a bar uh, for your... Maybe you can talk about your upcoming uh, project. Oh. Well, uh, just quickly, we're doing a a fashion runway show where artists have allowed us to use uh, some reproductions and patterns or motifs that have been in their work and we create, created different lines of clothing. And Josie, who's uh, in her wheelchair and has all these bags attached to her, her uh, 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 electric wheelchair, uh, is going to be one of the models and she's going to be wearing a $3,000 necklace. Uh, from uh, Alan Anderson uh, from Toronto, but we're doing different things like that. And Mario Genereux, who's an artist that came in with this wrapped, big, chunky piece. And I'm like, what is that? And he's like, oh, it's one of my artworks. And I didn't know he was an artist. Uh, and he just ripped it open. And it was this beautiful, luscious outsider piece of like this gigantic boat with suns and oceans going through and I'm like I'll give you a show come to X new set we have this like members lounge I'd like to introduce you to the community so yeah we have this interest in bringing people that have often been pushed away from the contemporary art world uh, I consider everything to be forms of visual art whether it's outsider art or design in some cases or you know self-taught artists that are not part of the system uh, we do a lot to bring those artists back into the fold and try to have an impact on their career. Um, you know, I have an example as well where, um, you know, at Saw, we're, you know, we're fairly close to uh, uh, the, the homeless shelters. And so it's, uh, you know, it, a, a whole community uh, um, uh, hangs out at Saw in the courtyard uh, during the summer months. And, uh, you know, where other businesses in the area will call the cops when they see, you know, a group of homeless people hanging out and drinking. We actually totally encourage it. We're like, we smoke pot too, so don't worry about it. Uh, so um, that being said, there was one night we were just hanging out and uh, we noticed that there were all these like ripped up drawings in the garbage can in the courtyard and they were really beautiful um, sort of trippy landscapes. Uh, that had all been ripped up, but there was like 50 of them. And so we pieced them all together with tape. And then we're like, we need to find this guy. Uh, and the guy, the guy was from uh, the mission in Ottawa, and he had been making drawings. He was frustrated, came to the courtyard, ripped them up. And uh, we were at, at that time planning our new Ottawa artist spotlight. And we were like, well, how about we work with you to do something super large scale? And we gave him uh, access to the gallery for a month, so that became sort of his studio. We bought him materials, and then he created uh, an immense mural in the gallery space. And that, to me, is um, it, sho it shows you the beauty of trying to seek out something new and um, you know, to give people opportunities where they might not have them. Uh, so yeah, meeting new people, um, is really key to uh, the way we work. If anybody else has any questions, we have a couple of minutes. So um, I have a question with the theme of curiosity as well. So I'm a self-teaching art student at the moment, and I'm uh, really curious about so many different forms of art. And whenever I'm on Instagram, I see very specialized artists, like I am this, I am abstract, I am modern, I'm realist, you know? And I'm interested in pastels, mosaics, abstract, realist, all of that. And how do I stop being curious? <laughs> 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 or specialize or whatever? <laughs> it's hard to say because 
I'm, I might be the same as you, you know, depending on the project, the, the, the form that it takes, the style that I will use uh, is really dependent on the concept. Uh, so I rarely encourage artists to like go into something like so programmed and, and, and sellable, like those things don't interest me, you know, it's, 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 it's really outside of my field of interest. I could never work for a commercial gallery. Uh, you know, an artist run center is really where I feel like I, I can, you know, function well as a curator. I mean, I don't know what your... Yeah, I mean, um, you know, that, that's the beauty of the artist run system uh, in Canada. It's very unique to Canada. These are uh, art institutions that are run by artists. So decisions are made by artists. The staff are normally are normally artists, so you can imagine there's a very different way of operating. Whereas, you know, in major institutions, they sort of light up when an artist gets invited to Documenta or the Venice Biennial. Um, we don't worry about those questions of, you know, art stars and that sort of thing. We're a little more grassroots and closer to what's happening in the real world. And um, I would encourage you to keep exploring. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, yeah. It's been really bad. Like academia has kind of stifled the art system. Uh, they really try to program you to be a certain type of artist and this is the yeah, uh, when you're 24 years old, I mean, people are looking for an, a commercial gallery to represent them. They're not even fully formed as like professional artists, and they're already chasing, uh, uh, yeah, commercial gallery opportunities. Uh, I remember we were all around the table with uh, Faith Ringgold, who's a, a very uh, famous uh, African American artist, and. Uh, Nicholas Gallinin, who was an emerging artist from Alaska, just asked her shyly, like, do you have any um, tips for me? I'm, I'm looking for a commercial gallery. And, and she goes, stop, stop, stop. How old are you? <laughs> and he said, I'm 28 years old. And then she said, you have another 40 years <laughs> to wait before you find a commercial gallery find someone that you trust, someone that you ha can have an honest relationship with, someone that, yeah, that you, you've developed a relationship for a very long time. I think it's much better to self-represent as an artist for as long as you can. And when you get to the stature of someone like Faith Ringgold, who got her first commercial representation when she was like 65, you know, and so peop young people are rushing way too quickly uh, to go into the commercial system and it affects uh, their output. So I would, you know, encourage people to slow down and experiment. I'm afraid, sure, why not? I think. Hi guys, great show by the way, thank you so much. Um, uh, my question is just that, uh, so I have some artist friends in Ottawa who I've heard the complaint before, you have to leave and go somewhere else, and I know that you both have done that, and I'm so glad that you're back, so mm -hmm. that's, that's really great. Um, what would your thoughts be on that, that you can't, that Ottawa's not a good center, do you know what I mean, that you have to go elsewhere, that, You've heard that though, right? That rumor. Could you could you tell me what your thanks? It would just really make me feel good to hear the other, the other side. Yeah, thank you. Uh, well, I mean, yeah, people love to sh <laughs> they love to shit on Ottawa, but they really don't know how great the city is. And there is a bit of a cultural renaissance happening at the moment, you know, with the School of Photographic Arts uh, opening a new location, the new uh, Ottawa Art Gallery building a 60,000 square foot museum, uh, Saw Gallery going through its own transformation. Um, and then, you know, commercial galleries are opening up again. Um, so it's actually kind of an interesting time to be an artist in Ottawa. Um, you know, this idea of moving away to get, a, you know, to get your career off the ground, I'm not, I'm not sure that that's a good strategy for a young person to run off to Toronto, not have much money. You know, trust fund babies, yeah, go ahead. Go to New York, <laughs> you know, 
have, have fun, you know, spending your money. But as a young artist, I wouldn't encourage you to join the rat race and kill yourself when you're young and you should be experimenting. You know, here, you know, it's a glorious city in that sense. Like I said, how wonderful Hall was. The rent's affordable. And then you can, you know, you concentrate on your own practice. Get a, you can get a two-bedroom in Ottawa for the price of a bachelor here. So you, get, you can have a studio. You'll never get that in Toronto. Um, no, and it, you, I, I don't know if you guys remember when Winnipeg had this, like, something was in the water and all the attention in Canada was really placed on this city that you wouldn't normally think as, like, a metropolis for art. And I think Ottawa and Gatineau are now in that moment, and we have to seize that moment right now to bring national attention to the artists that are working here. So we're working qu quite hard with other uh, partners. Uh, there might be a triennial of Ontario and Quebec art happening in 2019. Those are just things that we're exploring at the moment, but we don't want to lose uh, this momentum, so we're really working hard to uh, that everything is solidifying right now, and Saw Gallery will open in September, so we can't miss our shot. I, I really feel like this is the time uh, to make a big difference. And uh, before we close, uh, Saw is a recommender for uh, Ontario Arts Council's exhibition assistance. If there are any artists in the room, come talk to me after because we give $1,500 grants to uh, artists from Ottawa. Uh, so uh, I'll be sticking around having coffee and having fun with you guys. Uh, come see me and I'll, I'll tell you how to uh, access those funds. <laughs>